Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for having me here today to speak. Uh, it's a great honor to be amongst some of these great chefs in Mexico. And uh, believe it or not, this is the first time I've ever been to Mexico City, and it's a, a beautiful, beautiful city. I spent the last seven years um, within the state of Yucatan, and uh, I am co-owner of a restaurant called Heartwood, which is based in Tulum. I spend most of my time purveying and, um, and a lot of the time on the Milpa and kind of understanding a lot of the ancient civilization of the Mayan Empire and understanding what goes on in the Milpa and how it became a polyculture. Um, the, uh, the real reason why I started studying the Milpa is because I, I, I first based off my career in New York City for, for about 12 years. And I grew up in upstate New York and I grew up around farming and a lot of my family is involved with farming and a lot of cattle raising and uh, pig farming as well. And I wanted to find out exactly what it took to to do this within another country. What, 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 where did all this start? How did this become about? Because I know that it didn't start within the United States. I know that it started from older civilization. I knew that it started from Aztec, from the Mayan Empire. I knew it started from, you know, African. It was, it was all around. So uh, this is what led me down to the Yucatan, and it led me down to, to really figuring out and, uh, and believing that it still exists today. So what I'm going to be reading is some paragraphs from a book called The Modern Maya. All right, the, the Modern Maya is, um, it's, it's a book that was produced about 10 years ago. Um, it, excuse me one second. It's pioneers like Macduff and Everton, Charles Demigat and Hilario Heiler, who explored this way of life in the early 70s and 80s and are living legends of exploration within the Yucatan state. It is their efforts and guidance that have allowed us to push forward the roads leading into the Yucatan from Quintana Roo. Only have gotten paved about 10 years ago, so the early explorers trudged through the jungles and forests to live and grow within the Mayan people. Back then, chicle was the far most export of the area to watch the chicleras tap the sapote trees in crisscross formations along sap to, to drip, which later became chewing gum, which to me was incredible because you can still drive down a lot of those roads into the middle of nowhere and see crisscross shapes within a lot of the sapote trees. Um, not a lot of chewing gum is still produced, but it, it you know, was the foremost export back then. I'm not sure if the, the photos are going to come up on the screen soon, but these are photos of the region. And uh, I'm not a photographer, but uh, a couple of gentle and hires followed me for a couple of days and in showing this. So I hope that goes up soon. Um, so this is from the modern Maya, okay? The reverence of this is the Miopa, an account of Dario Tuz Kumal, a Mayan farmer, and his wife, Herculina Chipek, the Maya practice of growing vegetables, herbs, fruits, and hardwoods at their farm and home garden in agricultural additions and ceremonies thousands of years old. Dario Tuz Kumal was the first person I met when visited Chichimilia in 1969. At this time, his village was famous for its cooks, hammock makers, and those who, who are divine, curers, shamans, okay? In Chichimila, situated just five kilometers south of the colonial city of Valladolid, midway between Merida and the Caribbean coast of Quintana Roo, villagers carried on forms of Maya traditions that traced back thousands of years. It was an old village. I found foundations of ancient Mayan buildings in their yards. Dario is the Maya friend whom I've seen the most in 40 years of visits to the Yucatan. He married Herculena Chipek in 1958. When he was, eight, when he was 19, she was 17. They had 12 children, eight of whom lived. When I met Dario and Herculena, always appeared happy to be with each other and traded glances if they were newlyweds. Often at the end of a hard day of work, they would exchange massages, a tonic for tired muscles and relationships. Dario was a milpero. Hilario and I would often accompany Dario to his milpa. One afternoon in the spring of 1971, with the weather as hot as humid as a sauna, which is usually, that is the case, almost every day throughout the year. We helped him cut firewood. Our perspiration soaked and stained our blue denim work shorts. The light was glaringly bright and so intense that it gilded the edges of a few, a few of the clouds in the amazing blue sky. Dario was clearing a field on his land before the rainy season began. We used machetes and axes to cut up trees that Dario had felled and stacked the logs to the side where they would be safe. When he burned his field, 
Each day, Dario would carry a load back to his house. Firewood was a daily necessity. He and Herculena, like everyone else in Chichimila, cooked on an open fire. No firewood meant no heated meals, no hot tortillas, no hot water to bathe, and no fire to watch at night. We each tied up a bundle of firewood with lengths of handmade sisal rope and then attached our trump lines. We centered the loads on the small, the small of our backs and pulled the trump lines onto our foreheads. We walked bent over. Mine cut into my forehead and my neck muscles tinged from the weight. I, I watched my footing along the rocky trail, straining occasionally to look up to see where I was going. Okay? This is an activity that happens every day, all the time. And still to this day, you can go down, you can see it's still, it's still a lot of these guys are working the fields, a lot of these guys are in the streets, a lot of these guys are carrying these huge loads, and there's little to no machinery at all. The trail was rough and even. A sinuous ribbon only as wide as the loads we carried. Small little skirted trails. The contours of the rocky limestone outcroppings that are pocketed with sharp jagged edges like lava or worn or slippery, polished from use. A forest thick with vines, saplings and trees limited our view. Their roots were like veins that crisscrossed and embraced the limestone as they searched for soil. Now this is the real reason why you can parallel perseverance, okay? Just write in that sentence alone. Growing there is one of the most difficult areas to grow in that I've seen in the world, okay? There's very little soil, very little, the water is underground, you have huge trunks of trees searching for soil, searching for water, and the amount of perseverance that happens is translated within the Mayan people. So as the tree spreads its roots all across to other trees, all across to, you know, maybe about uh, 20 to 30 feet in search of water, in search of soil, as do the Mayans in keeping up these daily activities, in keeping their civilization alive. You know, and they're going on and on and teaching for all the generations. So, we watched our step to avoid tipping on the roots of the rocks or wedges sandal foot between them. We carried our machetes and scapboards strapped to our waist. If a vine or branch had grown too close to the trail, whoever was leading it cut it back. Leaves and shades of brown and yellow littered the forest floor and seemed a perfect camouflage for uh, snakes. I kept my eyes open and my head down. As we reached the outskirts of Chichimila, the trail widened into uneven streets of compacted earth and exposed limestone bedrock. At first, almost all the houses we built in the traditional mile style with pole walls, guano palm roofs, and floors hard compacted dirt like the street. As we get closer to the center, we started passing houses made of stone that had cement or tile floors or, and tropical cedar doors. The main house could be right on the street. If it was set back, you entered the property through a, a gate of sliding poles that kept larger domestic animals in and others out. Most households had at least three buildings, if not more, in their property. A main house for sleeping, another as a kitchen, and another one for storing corn. Each yard was surrounded by meter-high rock walls on at least half a hectare. The shift from forest to village was gradual because each Maya household had a large home garden, painted with herbs, spices, vegetables, ornamental fruit trees, and seedlings for transplanting to the fields. So they're taking, they're, where, they're, where they're growing and starting the seedlings is around their house. There, you can go and you can go to outside of all three of these homes and you can see all the different seedlings that they're nurturing, taking care of, watering before they, before they bring to the milpa, which is usually about three to four kilometers away. Okay. We reached Dario's house near the village center and dropped off loads on the street in front of the door. When his children ran out to greet us, Dario laughed and pulled up Jose, Ursina, and Victoria in his arms, all of which are his children. We sat down on the road to rest leaning against our bundles and wiped, our, wiped away the sweat from our eyes. One of us leaned back and said, in quote, sometimes I wonder why we carry these loads. It seems that our life is full of these hard time consuming jobs. Dario, who's in charge of the meal pod, was untying his bundle of firewood and turned to look over. He said, it's God's wish. He suggested in life, it's very difficult to help our few fellow human beings, yet each of us feel as the need to do this. So in order for us not to feel sufficient or helpless, God has given us these loads to occupy our time. We all laughed, translating this for him. It was just the sort of comment I was learning to expect from Dario. His neighbors often came to him for counsel, rather than answer questions directly or to tell them what to do. He would more often offer an allegory to help them solve their own problems. He listened well and responded with optimism. 
he said, good, your thoughts are beautiful. So the optimism that the, the Mayan culture presents every single day in their chores and activities and how they present themselves and the smiles that they wear and all of their daunting tasks is incredible. It's encouraging for your whole life. You know, um, everybody goes through things within cooking. Everybody has their trials, their, you know, their errors or tribulations within cooking, especially when you're young and you're just starting out. You have your chef screaming at you. You're not doing this right. You're not doing that right. You go through years and years and years of this until you finally come to a point where you can understand the optimism that others share within doing this. So when you go to a civilization like this, when you go to a culture like this, and you can see that it starts from 7 or 6, six 7 o'clock in the morning, all of your chores throughout the day in 90 degree heat and everybody's wearing a smile and everybody's organically growing, everybody's doing everything all natural and carrying on all their, their past heritage, it's really, really inspiring. You know, and it leads us with, here's a little bit more. In their yard, they tended several raised garden beds made from lash poles for, for growing herbs, tomatoes, radishes, onions, chilies, and other plants. High enough that their chickens, turkeys, and pigs could not reach them and also especially the ants. They used a, a louche to scoop water from buckets. A louche meaning a hickora dried out and in the inside used for water or used for eating from. Or, okay. They could spend their hours watering particularly citrus trees and other non-natives. They, hold, they hauled bucket after bucket from the well and dumped them at the base of the trees. Dario and Herculina had built a main house with a separate kitchen behind it that was a very traditional style for chichimila around the year of 1971. The traditional Maya house is one room, semicircular at both ends, and anchored by fork, forked main posts at each corner of an interior rectangle. It typically has two wooden doors in the middle across from each other, one in front and one in back. The earthen floor is raised several inches above the ground, with a rock retaining wall holding the compacted sascab and small other stones. This footprint is exactly what archaeologists look for when surveying house mounts for the ancient Mayan Mayan ruins. Roofs are made from guano palms woven into a lattice or roof beams and roof supports. The palm leaves insulate against the heat allowing air to rise and pass through the wall while keeping out the rain. Everything is thought about when building these houses and making these farms. Every single detail. When you visit these houses you're like, oh this is so simple. This looks like, you know, such a, you know, I wonder how they did this. But everything, every single purpose is for a reason. You know, when you go into our houses today, and we really enjoy the modern luxuries, I think it's important that if we all ask ourselves exactly what the things are that we buy in our house are really for and what we use them for. And then when you make the translation from today's world and you go back into this world that still exists today, you can really start to see what is really useful and what is not useful. That goes also within your kitchens as well. You know, what, what are you using in the kitchen today that's very necessary? Besides, you know, the most important thing being your hands, okay? And when you, when you go into these houses and you see them with mortar, pestle, when you see them, you know, breaking down the mazes by hand, you know, putting the cow on top of the corn, everything is done with a thought. Everything is done with a purpose. And being the fact that it's so hot, it's, everything is calculated. So if you're going to move your body, it better be for a purpose. And, it better, and better not, it should have two or three purposes attached to that. And that's the thoughtfulness. That's the whole thing that's combining this, you know. Um, traditional Maya houses are more like living organisms than static structures. A product of physical and emotional relationship with the environment that is sustainable. Intimate, complex, and profound. Leaves are turned, turned into a roof. Trees become posts and beams and walls. Every beam has its name. Every single... Part of the tree that is in the house comes from a different tree altogether. One has a forked top to hold the structure together. One is, you know, a shalom, which is a, you know, a larger hotter, or with someone is a sapote. It's all different types of hardwoods. This is what creates the house, okay? Everything, it's not just, you know, go into the forest, find this, find that, do whatever. It's, it's all thought out. It's a whole process altogether. Mayan villagers now know exactly what, the, what, what they have to cut before they go into the forest. They know what length and out of what hardwood to cut the main posts. When length to cut the beams, what poles will compose, what poles will compose the walls, 
what thick, thick vines to cut shape the oval ends and how many palm leaves to harvest that thatch roof and how much wrapping vine they need to tie the whole house together. Once they have collected their materials, they can complete a pole house in a matter of days. Typically, they call together friends and family to help tie the house with vines. Very strong community feeling when you go into these villages. Amaya, house is a, is, Amaya home is a dialogue between nature and builder that has been honed for a millennia evident in depictions of similar-looking thatched roof houses on the facades of stone buildings and architectural sites. Such as Usman and Alabna, built from local materials and suitable for the climate, responds to its environment. The Maya transforms something living into a functional home, and its livingness cannot be separated from the object. The combination symbolizes shelter, sanctuary, while affirmation of life. Dario and Herculina's house was a domicile with soul and tranquility. Almost everything they used in the daily life was grown around them. Their shelter, their utensils, their furniture, their hammocks, the slept in, and the food they ate. All was a product of their work and collaboration with nature and the Mayan gods of the rain and forest. When you live in a house of pole walls, you are subtly aware of everything around you. The shadow of a, pla- a passing cloud affects the light filtering in the house. When a breeze springs up, you not only feel it, but also it rustles the thatch. You hear a plum drop from a tree, a chicken clucks, a, a turkey gobbles, a rooster crows, a pig grunts, a dog barks, a child runs past. The house shelters you without insulating you from surroundings. I think that when we read that, when we hear that, we understand that the true meaning of growing local Okay. This is a civilization that's been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. We are talking about this now and really bringing it to light now when we have so much to learn from the wheel that already existed. You know, and it's, uh, it's an amazing thing to see that in action. I, I really and, uh, I, I recommend everybody to go and visit the Mayan ruins, go and to visit the Mayan meal pods, go and visit these Mayan communities and go through because they're there for you to look into the, into the past, to look at the example that still exists. It's, you know, it's, you don't have to go into a book. You don't have to do all this research, this or the other. You really have to just get onto a plane and drive through, and you can see it day by day. You know, it's, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Just to let you know, we're going to read what they, what they grew on their milpa. And, uh, you know, classically, the milpa is a reference with growing corn, but this one, you know, and most others are growing everything that they need for their daily consumption. So Dario and his family ate well when harvests were good. Besides corn, Dario grew squash, black beans, lima beans, black-eyed peas, lentils, chilies, tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, watermelons, cantaloupes, honeydews, chayote, peanuts, pineapples, sesame seeds, sweet potatoes, yams, cassavas, camotes, jicama, arrowroot, papaya, mangoes, bananas, and other fruits. Just the fruits in their milpa alone, okay? Vegetables and spices. At home, he and his family grew chaya, onions, garlic, radishes, cabbages, mint, marjoram, parsley, cilantro, basil, epazote, ruda, lettuce, and several varieties of tomatoes and chilies, some of which we, he has also planted in his milpa. So that's not even... They're not even talking about the meal pot. They're just talking what's grown around their house, okay? Uh, before I moved to the Yucatan, I could barely grow um, a basil out my window, you know? And, and here they are growing so much more than I could possibly imagine. You know, it's, it's, it's really kind of amazing. Their orchards, both at home and in the meal pot, provided papayas, mangoes, coconuts, Okay. Several varieties of uh, bananas and plantains, avocados, limes, several varieties of sweet oranges, one sour, one sweet. Grapefruits, a variety of sapodillas, sidwellas, star apples, allspice, several varieties of tropical plums and cherries. Okay. They both shared a network of friends and family who turned their shared lives, every, although everything that grew something, not everyone grew the same species. So that brings me to the next part of how the market and the community of the Mayans really grow and exist today. Okay? That book, the, those paragraphs were from a book called Modern Maya. And once again, it's from Hilario Heiler and Macduff Everton. He's the first, one of the first explorers to go down there within the late 60s and start really going into this area and looking at some of these things and how it's being produced. All right. So the, the restaurant Harwood that we've been running for the past six, seven years has been started with an idea of um, basically uh, my wife and I had just enough 
money to start something, okay? We were really, really broke. Um, we built with no walls. We had no electricity. We worked only off solar energy um, with a small backup generator. We could get our water brought in, and, uh, and then it started taking off from there. We cook only over open, open fire, uh, which I was used to doing in New York for about eight years of um, cooking with, working with the oven. So that I was used to. But the area itself and working in the area itself, being right off the Caribbean, was a whole new educational thing. I didn't go down there with an idea of, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. Uh, I'm really familiar with my surroundings. I'm really familiar with Mexico. It was a whole thought altogether. It was a whole, you know, uh, kind of experiment. We were very nervous, uh, just like I am today, actually. <laughs> So the restaurant is off the grid, so we rely on alternative forms of energy like solar and wind. We cook only over open fire in a wood fire oven that we made ourselves. We break down our own waste and gray water, giving us a zero carbon footprint. Composting is a daily activity that we all participate. Uh, the restaurant tries to emulate the Mayan meal pot to a certain degree. The Sayan Khan biosphere where we based is a tropical and incredibly diverse and the fish we serve are uh, speared each day along the Mesoamerican reef system, meaning we don't use long lining, we don't use netting. Um, we go down and we hunt the fish ourselves and we use spear guns. Um, the langosta and the pulpo are caught each day by hand. Market runs happen about two times per week, bringing us further southwest into the interior, all the way across the state of Campeche, where almost every farm is organic. The trip is, the trip is based on purveying and is in total of four, four hours in and four hours out. That's how I became more familiar with the Mayan Milpa, with the Mayan community, about going four hours into the middle of nowhere, roads unknown, and then four hours back with the produce that we're getting from these places. Um, Within the Yucatan, there's a place called the Huerta de Estado, which all of these things are grown. And um, uh, there's a red soil, and it's an extremely fertile land. And so the, the, this market sends out to all the rest of the markets within the state of Quintana Roo and Yucatan. Um, I wanted to see that myself, so then I got really kind of addicted to that market and kept going and going and going. Therefore, spending many hours in the car, um, not having, you know, spending half my time between the service and the restaurant, the meal pot, and also running to these markets. Um, a lot of it were kind of going down roads that I had no idea where I was going, uh, meeting strange people that I didn't know I was going to be meeting, um, caught my car breaking down, catching on fire, uh, running out of water, no cell phone signal. A lot of these are the hardships to try to look for organic farms, try to look for fruits and vegetables that have not been seen yet. Um, our communal work in the Mayan Milpa or traditional crop growing system is one that we're not only proud of but also extremely grateful to participate in. And this discussion about community will shed some light on what is exactly that creates the otherness of the Maya Milpa, the otherness of the Maya Milpa, meaning uh, something other than yourself, something that is, you don't identify with right away because it's so sacred and it's so old and it's been going on for years and years, for thousands of years. These details will allow us to catch a glimpse of a civilization, a civilization that has had the answers to many of today's questions before we even started asking them. I'll present to you a word about the Mayan Milpa like 40 years ago, how it remained the same today. Like I said, I'm not a photographer, but a lot of these photos behind you are from a couple that um, accompanied me one, one day while going out to these, uh, these market trips. The true definition of community is, in my opinion, a group of people with something in common, whether that is the area where they live or, or a particular characteristic that bonds them together. The characteristics that I find the most inspiring is passion, specifically a passion for hard work, because hard work, passion, and happiness creates beautiful harvest. In a community like ours, interactions are non-rehearsed. There may be flaws or moments of imperfections in the way we touch, speak, and feel our emotions. These imperfections are what lead to organic growth, to crisscrossing our ideas and allowing them to run from one person to the next. This is the Mayan Milpa, a conversation not only between people, but also between all living things within its borders and beyond. Everything happens on an open air platform where nothing is confined by pesticides or inorganic materials. When the produce grows freely like this, it can cross pollinate, creating new fruits and vegetables along the way. For example, the Melon de Milpa. It looks like a squash on the outside, but inside it's all cantaloupe. Or look at the jackfruit, a descendant of five different fruits. Could you imagine if all farms you saw today could start growing more sustainable organic produce and freely express themselves in the same way? When you don't break, I mean, okay, 
if you're growing crops for a large community and, you know, you, the, that area is really good with growing tomatoes and corn, that's one thing. But within the Mayan Milpa, they're all spread together. So you might go to the Mayan Milpa and look at it and be like, oh, my God, this is a bad farm. Everything is growing all over the place. It's overgrown. It's grown together. You can't even tell what is what. Is what. And, but when you look closer, you can start to see new fruits. You can start to see things that you never saw before. You can start to look closer and see, you know, a 15-foot maracuya, you know, a passion fruit tree, pizzahaya. You can start to see how, um, uh, you know, tomate estatal is grown from rock to rock, uh, attaching itself to underground roots, which, you know, elaborate within cenotes. All of these things are cross-germinated with each other, producing sustainable produce that we can use in today's world. So you don't have to just limit yourself to... This, that, or the other every day within your diet. You can mix the two together. This is hence how superfoods came about, like, um, like chaya, having four times the more nutrient than spinach. Um, like um, anona, which is now learned to be, you know, kind of uh, mixed in and mashed in with alfalfa, with mixed in with a seed and fed to, to pigs to help give them a healthier, you know, um, uh, uh, being, you know, to make, them, to make them a little more fat and to make them more healthier within the hot sun. Um, this is basically the mind milpa, a conversation, you know, not only between people, but also between all living things within its borders and beyond. Everything happens on an open platform where nothing is confined by pesticides, you know. It's, uh, the milpa is classically in reference to maize, but it's a polyculture where the milpa, milpero gives giving each crop a lot of attention, a community of living things sharing the same soil. Traditionally, each mine household has its own meal pot, which provides enough fruits and vegetables for the family. Anything left from the harvest is brought to the community market and sold by that family's representative, usually the elder and all at a common price. In other words, there is no calabasa vendor who has the best calabasa and sells them at a higher rate. This is one thing I'm not, uh, that I really couldn't get used to. When I would go to the farmer's market and I would see someone selling the best calabasa, this is mine that I've only grown a couple of, and I'm going to sell this to you at this certain price because this is it. Okay? This, in my opinion, is not the community market. In my opinion, is all coming together, selling their things at an equal price. So the guy over here selling tomatoes is the same person over here at the same price selling tomatoes. Nothing separates you. You're both growing tomatoes, and they're both organic, and they're both beautiful, and they're both going to be used in a very special way by the chef that takes them from this point on. You know? So this is what I love the most about the Mayan Empire. Is in other words, there's no... Co so the vendors agree on a fixed price for each item based on their mutual understanding and equality. It is a truly beautiful sight to see people laughing, smiling, and talking amongst each other at the market, each vendor very proud of his or own display, but even prouder of the family for growing it. So the meal pot grows a certain amount, and then at the end of the day, they gives it to an elder, and that elder then passes it along to the market, and then they sell it amongst each other. When you're the buyer, there's no Ill, Ill will towards you for buying from one person, not the next. Many times I've gone in search of meal de mame, or honey from a mame sapote tree. I'll ask one vendor for the honey, and she'll walk me over to another vendor who is selling it that day. There's no competition, but there are some bargaining. The will for the community to succeed is greater than the individual's. So you see, the will for the community to succeed is greater than that individual's special amazing honey to succeed. Allowing us to see another lesson in which we learn from the Mayan community. These, Im these images behind me are those of the Mayan heritage milpa. Again, pesticides and fertilizers are not used here. The, the earth is rocky. The water is tapped from the cenotes about 10 to 15 feet below ground. This is the milpa de monte, where ants are king, consuming everything in their pants, uh, the past, including whole bee colonies. The milpa is burned twice a year, both to regenerate the soil and to rid the growing areas from ants and other pests. The growing seasons are based on these ritual burnings and allows for a better season. The ants are incredible. I've never seen more ants in my life. The ants eat everything. You could grow one thing one day and spend two to three months growing it, and the ants will come the next night and eat it within a matter of a half hour. It's, it takes a lot of work, and it is extremely hard farming there. Farming in such a climate is a specific ability that is passed down from one generation to the next. The temperature in the interior is at times hotter than the same as our beach side. It runs in the high 90s during the day, and at night drops about 80. There are cold snaps during the year, but they are rare. We get about two months straight rain where flooding is common due to the limestone wedge we are on the stage shouts up. So this is more about my story with Antonio that I met seven years ago, and I've learned him from, from him every single day since. 
We have always worked at Hardwood together, building Hardwood. He teaches us not only about farming and how the earth shapes the things we eat, but also about family. He has 10 kids and more insight into hard work than most of us could even imagine. He has become a mentor to me in my adult life, and I am very proud to know him and pass the years in his company with his family. His cooperative that we work out is seven kilometers from the main road in the mine community outside Tekuch, where, so, where, where we're so remote that the people, all you hear are the wind and the pajaros during the day. I'll sum it up because I'm running out of time, but um, I'm very, very grateful to be working with Antonio. He has become like a father to me in coming down here and has filled a void in my life in understanding so much more about how we cook and about how we do the things we do within the kitchen and where the products come from and how they get from point A to point B and where they started in the history that we represent today. So within conclusion, I'd really like to say, you know, thank you very much for allowing me to be here and to speak. And um, I hope that, you know, we all understand it's not so much a matter of, you know, what you're cooking as long as you're, you know, cooking with the best intention in mind and that you're serving each neighbor around you the way that you want to be served. So within that, I say thank you to Mesa America. I thank, say thank you to Enrique for inviting me. And, uh, and I wish you all the best. I'll be back next year. Thank you, guys.